it is my pleasure to introduce my friend Elizabeth Cassio. She is an economist serving as an associate professor of economics at Dartmouth, having joined Dartmouth in 2006. She is a research associate, associate in the programs on education, development of the American economy, and children at the National Bureau of Economic Research. She is also a research associate at the Institute for the Study of Labor. She was the co-editor at the Journal of Human Resources from June 2014 to October 2019. She received a BA summa cum laude from Franklin and Marshall College in 1997 and her PhD in economics from the University of California at Berkeley in 2003. She joined the Dartmouth faculty in 2006 and is a tenured associate professor of economics. She's an economist specializing in the study of education and social policy, often in historical perspective. Her recent and ongoing research endeavors to understand how educational and social progress is enabled and held back by matters of foreign policy or by policy, design, economic conditions, and political voice. Elizabeth lives in Hanover with her husband, who is also a tenure professor in the economics department at Dartmouth, and she has two beautiful daughters. Elizabeth is here to talk today about a timely subject for the upcoming election, only a few weeks, only, gosh, less than two weeks away, a century of the American woman voter. Again, it's my pleasure to introduce Elizabeth Cassio. Thank you so much, Dave. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, if I get into the mode here where you can see all my slides. Um, so it's, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, this is, I guess, not uh, my first presentation um, for a Rotary Club. I, um, it's my second and I'm always inspired uh, to, to hear about the great work uh, that you do. Um, I'm also, as, as Dave mentioned, I'm, I'm not only a professor at, at Dartmouth, I'm, I'm Dave's friend. And so you shouldn't, you shouldn't hold him accountable or responsible for anything I'm gonna say <laughs> today. Um, uh, I will say, you know, this has been kind of a, the discussion so far has been kind of an, an election free zone, which is, which is nice. Um, so I, I'm kind of hesitant to, to, to introduce it back in, into the conversation. Um, but I will say that, you know, I am approaching what I'm going to talk about today um, as, you know, as a social scientist, as, as an economist, and kind of just bringing some new data to light to try to understand kind of where as we are as, as a country politically, which has bearing on where we are economically as well. Um, so this election coming up in less than two weeks is, is historic for a number of reasons. You know, it's in the middle of a pandemic. We have first woman of color on, on the ballot on, on a major party ticket. Um, you know, it's also, this year is also the centennial of the 19th amendment, which granted American women full uh, suffrage rights, a sort of a constitutional right to vote. Um, and I was asked, and, and I will put in the chat um, the paper that I wrote here on this topic um, after I'm done, um, asked to write a paper kind of about the evolution of women um, as political actors over the last century that it, you know, ultimately ended up being published in a symposium in the Journal of Economic Perspectives earlier this year. And what I, I wanna draw some, uh, some, some results from that paper here for you Today, in particular, I want to think about two questions. Okay, so I drew an arrow here. Okay, basically, how did we get from there on the left, the picture on the left hand side, to, to here? Um, um, this this over the over the past century. Um, the, the people on the right hand side are not wearing masks. I'll have some pictures like that <laughs> later later on here in the presentation. So what happened? Um, Things have changed, how have they changed? And then why did they change kind of the way that they do? Um, and, I'll, and I'll try to wrap up with just some quick, quick thoughts on um, you know, what this means for where we're going to go um, in the future. And before I, before I really get into it, if you really have any question while I'm, I'm talking, if, I don't know what your norms are exactly. I'm used to people raising their hands um, and, and, and spe are speaking out. So I won't be offended at all if, if, if you do that. In fact, sometimes I feel like I'm just talking into the void <laughs> whenever, whenever, whenever um, I'm not getting any feedback. Okay, so in, how, in terms of how did we get from there, um, you know, 1920 to where we are now? I guess it's important to think about kind of what there and in here really meant. So I'm gonna be talking about 
voter turnout as well as partisanship and sort of what did their look like. Um, women initially, and we can first see this, they have much lower turnout than men. So even when, when given full voting rights, they're not, they're not voting um, um, as, as often um, as men are as, or with the same kind of likelihood. Um, and when women do cast ballots, at least early on, and, and in fact, for, for quite a long time, um, they really cast them in ways similar to men, okay? So it's, it, the, the major parties aren't really split all that much on um, issues that might matter relatively more to women. And by the way, we shouldn't be thinking about all women as being the same here or there being some idea of like a even like a women's voting block. This is all just sort of tendencies, uh, which I'll be talking about um, over time. Um, so what happens, you know, what is here now? Um, well, there is a process by which women catch up with men in terms of voter, voter turnout and, and ultimately overtake um, men's voter turnout rates. So women now turn out at the polls at higher rates than, than men do. And they also vote differently. So over time, women have started voting more for say democratic um, presidential candidates and you know, responding to surveys that they, they identify more with the democratic party, okay? Relative, relative to men. So there's a, a gender gaps have emerged both in terms of turnout and in terms of, of partisanship. Okay, just to sort of remind you um, of what the world um, looked like um, in, in August 1920, this, this, you know, you might know this already, but some states had actually already granted even full suffrage rights to women before the 19th Amendment. So those are the ones that are here in, in white. They're mainly actually, you might think, oh, it was really the Northeast that would have been at the, the forefront of this. No, it was actually the West. Um, and if you look over here, we have to, I wanted to make sure I pointed out Vermont. So here, here is Vermont. Um, this is kind of an antiquated map, but, but the shading here in Vermont and then the dates tell us that Vermont had both presidential suffrage and municipal suffrage for women that was granted between, it's a little bit blurry here, but between 1916 and 1920. So 1920 would have still been the first presidential election in which Vermont women would have been um, able to cast a, a ballot. Um, so what this means now, then when we look at the data, so for this, for this uh, project, I put together data from so, so many sources. Um, this black line here, which is the first thing I'll draw your attention to, uh, what I've done here is I've taken the total number of votes cast in the election and just divided by the total voting age population, including both men and women. So that's why you see kind of like, oh, is turnout really 30%? Well, no, it's probably a lot, it's a lot higher among among men and, and much, much lower among women here in this pre-1920 period because most women don't have the right to vote in presidential elections. Between 1916 and 1920, okay, 1920 being the first election um, that women can vote, we don't see a doubling though of this number, um, which is kind of nearly what we would expect to see. So that turnout rate among women uh, for, for the whole um, country goes up by more like 35 to 40%. It doesn't go up by 100%. And it continues to evolve, right? By the time we get to the 1940s, we have kind of um, a sort of the, the turnout rate kind of stabilizes with the exception of kind of during, during the war and, and, after, and after World War II. Um, so so that's, that's the first thing I wanted to point out here that we already have evidence in just, just baseline election returns that women are not you know, early on voting at the same rates as men are. Second thing I'll point out is that um, we have lots of different surveys that provide information both on, well, a self-report of whether a person voted and, and basic demographic information like, like gender. So the first, the first um, source here, these are Gallup polls. Um, George Gallup, um, I guess, famously saying something like early on, um, you wanna know how women are gonna vote on election day, um, you know, exactly as they were told the night before. So he didn't have a lot of um, interest necessarily in gathering a lot of data from women because um, he thought that there was, that women were not gonna vote in very high numbers. And if they did, he had the answer already in terms of how men were voting, okay. Um, 
Another thing you notice here is that the self-reported voter turnout rates tend to be higher than what we see in, in the administrative data. Um, people tend to forget whether they actually voted or, or maybe are telling some, some falsehoods sometimes. Um, but the reason why this is important is that um, this is the first year around 1940 that we can even start thinking about understanding the true male-female gap in, in voter participation. And that's what I'm gonna show you here. So this is for, for 1940. Despite George Gallup and how he decided to draw his samples, um, I, I have some kind of sophisticated techniques for trying to get um, an unbiased estimate of, of what these voter participation rates are. You see pretty high turnout overall. These are numbers unlike what we see later on um, in the 20th century and in, in, into today. Um, but we do see this large uh, gender gap. So in, in 1940, women were 9.7 percentage points less likely than men to have voted, or we have what I'm gonna call a gender gap of about 9.7 percentage points. Um, now I'm gonna add some more data here. We'll skip ahead by 40 years to 1980. The gender gap is gone in 1980. And, and turnout is lower, yes. Um, by 19, oh, sorry, by 2016, women have higher turnout rates than men, okay? So by about four percentage points. I can put this also on a graph where I'm plotting all of the gender gaps kind of election by election. So you can see the overall um, evolution of it. The changes were pretty rapid between uh, 48 and, and 1980, and they've kind of tailed off a little bit, but you know, still continue to change more, more recently. And I'll talk briefly about that shortly. Um, I, I'm showing you this graph because I, when, I, when I'm going to talk about partisanship here next, it's going to be shown in the same kind of form. So what you see here is the gender gap, okay, women minus men, and the likelihood of voting for the Democratic um, nominee for Democratic candidate for president. Um, and this little dashed line here, that is the share of votes going to the Democrat in the election. So it's kind of punctuated by election years where the Democrat wins. Um, so what you see here is, you know, women really liked Eisenhower. Okay, so, so they were more likely to vote for Eisenhower, but women have been kind of more consistently, particularly since 1980. So it first happened with Reagan, been more consistently likely to vote for, for the Democrat um, on the ticket or on the ballot. Um, this also shows up, and by the way, these little shaded regions, that's telling us something about our st the statistical confidence, okay, that we have um, in, in, in these estimates. I have even more data on party identification. And so I'm adding two lines here. Um, and this is, again, this is the gender gap in party identification. It shows kind of a similar kind of trend that more and more relative to men, women are identifying um, with the Democratic Party. One thing that has happened to the Democratic Party, is, as I, I know all of you realize, is that fewer and fewer people, particularly between 1960 and 1980, were identifying with Democrats because of the loss of the South um, 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 by, by, by the Democratic Party. Okay. Um, so, so those are the basic results. Now, why did change happen? Well, for voter turnout, this was a matter of generational change. For partisanship, um, it's not about women's um, issue preferences becoming more aligned with the Democratic Party over time. It's more about the Democratic Party's agenda becoming more aligned with women, where women are um, politically. Um, so it's, it's more really about party polarization. And I'll just use my last few minutes here to, to walk through that. So um, I'm gonna show you now these gender gaps um, for different cohorts, so different birth cohorts. So right here, the greatest generation, the first half of the greatest generation, um, this would think about people born a little bit before um, um, the turn of, of the 20th century. So there was a really big gender gap here. 12 percentage points. For the silent generation, so this would have been the generation right before the baby boomers, it's down to three percentage points, okay? That group would have been born after, um, uh, after the uh, um, 19th Amendment was ratified. For baby boomers, it's a three percentage point gap. 
And for Gen X, it's about a 5.3 percentage point gap. So every successive generation, okay, um, has women kind of gaining on men and, and eventually um, overtaking, overtaking them. Um, notice here that voter turnout rates tend to be lower among baby boomers and, and Gen X. Part, part of what's happening here is that elections have become in some sense less competitive over time and so turnout has fallen, but there's also a really strong relationship between age and voting. And Gen X, you know, these people are, they still haven't peaked out in terms of what their, you know, voter turnout is going, is going to be. Um, I can show you this also in this way, um, which is showing us cohort now by cohort what that gender gap is year by year. So we have I point out the same generations here, but if we take this, you know, first half of, of the greatest generation, um, what we're seeing here, taking the maybe the second point, is that in the 44 election, there was about, you know, a 10 percentage point gap. And it got it got bigger as, as the cohort aged. But for many of these cohorts, these lines are pretty flat across the entire life cycle. I'm pointing out the silent generation here because that is the one which had parity basically across most of the life, life cycle, um, which is, which is um, uh, fascinating, or it has so far. Um, so um, that, it looks like the stair step pattern, and that's really what's driving the, the sort of overall gender gap um, in turnout to, to narrow and then kind of flip more um, in favor of women. I can do exactly the same thing for partisanship and you don't see that stair step kind of pattern at all. You see all of these generations from say born 1917 and later um, identifying more with the Democratic Party at exactly the same time in much the same way, okay? So this isn't a story about, um, you know, of, of generational change. It's more a time story. There's something going on at a given point in time that is tends to be drawing um, women, at least in relative terms, um, more um, toward toward Democrats. So um, what is this? Uh, so one one thing that I brought up as a possibility is well maybe you know maybe women are becoming more liberal, at least in relative terms. Is that it? Well, we don't have many kind of public opinion questions consistently asked over, over time. One that we have is sort of hypothetical, like what, would you vote for a president that has particular characteristics? So would you vote for a black president? Would you vote for a female president? The um, lines on this graph without dots those are showing you on average how people overall have changed their responses to these questions over time. Okay, so it used to be that, you know, back in the late 50s, you know, let, you know around, say it's on the right axis here, around 40% of people said they were willing to vote for a black president. By 2010, the last time this question is asked, it's, it's, it's you know, almost 95%, okay? We see a similar kind of evolution for women, although it doesn't for voting for a women president, woman president, but it doesn't um, start off at such a low number. Of course, I'm an economist, like people, what people say and what they do. <laughs> I'm more interested really in what people do, but this is, this is interesting. So there's been, anyway, there's, this is an example of, of um, um, an issue or a series of issues where public opinion has shifted dramatically across over time. But these little dotted lines, what they're telling you is that men and women are kind of moving along in the same way, okay? Um, this, the, the gender gap in the responses to these questions is just kind of bouncing around zero, okay? Over this entire period. So it's not as if women are kind of more quickly saying they'd vote for a black president or vote for a woman. We can also look at this in, this is, I should have written out what GSS was. This is the general social survey. So um, this is the best data. These are the best data we have on us on lots of different kind of public opinion questions over a long period of, of time. They're not asking the same people, but you know, different cross sections of individuals over time. And so 
what I have here are sort of mean values on certain variables, as well as what the gender gap is. So how women respond minus how men respond. So in terms of voting in the last election, and um, uh, in terms of voting in the last election, during this period, which includes 1980 and 1984, there's not much of a gender gap. That's what I was showing you earlier. Um, more recently, there's been more of a gender gap. This is a little bit low relative to what we see in other data. Um, what about uh, Dem Democratic Party identification or voting for a Democrat? Um, we don't see too much in terms of um, voting, uh, identifying as a Democrat in these data, but you see a lot in terms of voting for the Democrat in, in, in the previous presidential election, okay? So that, this is kind of replicating what we saw before. Now in terms of public opinion questions, um, just to, actually before I highlight anything for you here, these are indices on a variety of issues and the bigger the number, the more progressive okay, you could think of, of, of people's views as being. So if we take here, for example, um, this criminal justice index, um, people we have as a society become more progressive on, issue, on, on issues surrounding criminal justice over time, but this gender gap really hasn't changed that much over time. So women have always been kind of more progressive here than men have. Um, um, but there are a couple, there are only really two examples here where, um, you, know, we, you know, we've become more progressive as a society and women have become more progressive faster. So one would be in terms of attitudes towards sexuality and the other one in terms of women's public roles. Okay. But in terms of like many other things, including, you know, family gender roles, government spending, like progressive um, government can think, thinking about racial equality and so on. That's really evolving similarly, at least in terms of what people say. Um, so what's really driving it? I mentioned it's really about party polarization, okay? So um, I don't wanna get like wrapped up in words here, but, but what I wanna, I'll, I'll just sort of summarize what, what's happening in this table as showing that um, parties have become, yes, more polarized over time. And to some extent along dimensions where women tend to have different points of view, okay? Um, and so we see the polarization here um, and, and, um, and it, it, it grows over time. Um, in terms of, you know, attitudes towards sexuality or women's public roles, um, you know, these are places where the party, get, these are places where men and women have kind of evolved differently and where the parties have also evolved somewhat differently as well. Okay, where the party gap um, in, in, sort of in this is, has changed as well. Okay. okay, so where do we go from here? And I'll wrap up, thank you. Um, so the change is that we've seen, it's not really like idiosyncratic. It's not really like just election to election. There are some structural issues going on right now and there are different structures for turnout and partisanship. So girls are somehow getting socialized a little bit more early in life about the importance of, of voting. Um, and that you know, appears to have just been evolving over time and getting reinforced. Um, and in terms of partisanship, it appears to be more about party structure um, in, in, in the country. And so I think the future role of women in politics or as political actors, I guess I should say, really depends upon how these structures evolve. For example, are parties gonna become more or less polarized over time? My sense is that we're looking at sort of more polarization. Um, but there are some idiosyncratic features here at this election that might matter um, more for, for women. Um, you know, COVID, we have a situation where people are standing in long lines, not just long lines, but also masked. Um, lots of safety protocols potentially having to happen, you know, inside vote, voting places and unprecedented um, mail-in voting um, um, in this election. So um, these are really big changes. My sense from the polling that I've seen so far is that um, you know, we're just continuing along these lines of, of, of women continuing to turn out more and, and to vote differently. But you know, polls can only get us so far, we actually have to see um, what happens. So I'll, I'm gonna stop here and I'm totally happy to take um, your questions. I can also cycle back here to um, 
to the slides if you'd like to see anything in particular. Thank you, Liz. Great presentation. Uh, the, the numbers were, uh, there's a lot of numbers, but uh, economists love those. Yeah. Um, so last election, there was a lot of noise about uh, internet influence from third parties. And when you, when you go through your statistics, are you able to see that? I mean, I saw a democratic lean, which was, they were supposedly um, sort of marketing against that, but any comment there? I, I mean, I'm, I'm just kind of taking like the, the data here at, at face value and I haven't been able to get into like an analysis of um, how that worked, right? I, and since I was focused on the gender gap, I mean, I think it's a really interesting question to think about are those kind of influences, you know, are, are women more or less susceptible to them than, than, than men are? Because it is sort of a variable that's changing, you know, um, um, <laughs> a right. lot right now. Right. Yeah, and there right. was a question here in the chat. Um, yes, okay, so there was a question here. This is a great um, um, question about, um, what do I have a, a, an analysis of white versus non-white women? Um, and the answer is yes. And I, I really should have brought it into this presentation. Despite the 19th amendment right giving all women the right to vote, we know that blacks in the South were still basically very much disenfranchised until 1965 with passage of the Voting Rights Act. So, so um, black women, um, and black men still though, were, were very disenfranchised between 1920 and 1965. So there are dramatic changes here. And we've looked into whether, you know, um, can that explain kind of anything that we see? Um, and it, it, it doesn't a, appear to like that, that the, the sex gap in the South versus, um, the sex gap in voting in the South is just high regardless of race, <laughs> for example. And, and that and that is and in, in, in it, it then it kind of ramps up really quickly um, later. Um, so yes, yes, did for today, today by regions of the country. Yeah, so um, in the South, again, so speaking about that, um, I you know, I, I won't quote any numbers, but the, the, the participation gap between black women and black men in the South is much bigger than it is in other parts of the country. And there could be a variety of like, again, structural reasons for that about, um, you know, there's you've probably heard in the news, all sorts of issues surrounding Florida's move um, to allow felons to vote, but then kind of coming back on that and saying, no, ex felons, like, you, no, you can't unless you pay off your, your traffic tickets. Um, and so um, people who are in prison, we know that uh, like a lot of black men are in prison and then they can't vote in prison. And sometimes they can't vote even when they get out of prison and that differs across parts of the country. Liz, I have a quick question. In, in this election, what are the, maybe the top two or three issues that are most likely to bring women out more so? Right. Like I saw, I saw prioritize some, a top, yeah. Yeah, I saw some joke um, on, um, I think it was a joke, but it was kind of serious. I think it was on Twitter that according to this woman's Facebook uh, feed, it was youth sports <laughs> reopening. <laughs> Can, is hockey going to play or not? You know, um, so so I, I, I don't know. I think, but I do think that the pandemic right now, um, from the statistics that I've seen has been, um, it's been, well, it's been trying on many people, especially like lower income populations, but just looking at sort of overall population, women with kids have been hit pretty hard by this. And I think there are questions surrounding schools and safety, like health and safety. Um, those are kind of classic though, dare I say like women's issues, um, like education and um, um, public health. Um, so so I, I think, and given the situation we're in, I mean, that is the kind of, those are the kinds of issues that could really turn women out in, in very, very high numbers um, this, this year. But I'm spitballing, I don't know for sure. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So we're uh, past the 
one o'clock mark. If we have other questions, maybe a quick one. Um, if not, uh, thank you very much, Liz, for a great presentation. Now put, I'm going to put um, the um, the uh, link to the article if you want to look at the article in in the chat right now. And I think thank it's you. available for download for free. Okay, terrific. Then we'll uh, wrap up this meeting uh, on the short note. And thank you everyone for attending. And we'll uh, talk to you next week. Take care. Thank you.